In Rise to Glory, players compete to earn the most glory. There are many ways to earn glory in the game. By researching technologies or conquering cities. By creating great artworks or hosting civilization's great icons like Marie Curie and Nelson Mandela. By building world wonders and launching a starship to explore new worlds. To earn all this glory, you'll need two things. You'll need gold to build units and expand your realm. And you'll need commerce to research technologies and purchase great artworks. Gold is basically your tax revenue. The more population you have, the more gold you can generate. But you'll also need infrastructure to support that population. So the more buildings you have, the more gold you can generate. Commerce is like your GDP, and it comes from two sources. Your trading fleet and the number of different resources you have access to. There are 15 resources in the game, 10 of which appear from the get-go, like horses and wine, and others, like coal and oil, that only appear later in the game. You can gain access to resources by building cities on lands that contain them, or by trading with other players who have the resources you need. You'll also need resources to recruit certain types of units. For example, to recruit cavalry, you'll need horses at the beginning of the game, but you'll need oil at the end. There are seven units in the game. Scouts, infantry, cavalry, artillery, ships, and, later, aircraft and nuclear missiles. For setup, the first thing you'll do is decide how long a game you want to play. Most players will want to play one or two eras. Each era takes about two or three hours. You can start in any of the first four eras. So for example, you could start in the medieval era, the second one, and play until the end of the industrial era, the third one. The player's starting materials will vary based on which era you start in. In this video, we'll assume we're starting in the ancient era, the first one. To set up for the other eras, just check the rulebook. Each of the players will get the following. A civilization board, which tracks the player's population and buildings, as well as their government type, resources, and trading fleet. A player aid that shows what can be bought and how to earn glory and wonders. A bid card and draw erase marker for secret bidding. And each player will also have five trackers, two of which will be used to uh, track your population. Uh, players start with a population of four, so you won't need the second tracker right now. Just place it here in the zero space. And place a third tracker on your starting government despotism. You'll start with 16 resource barrels to track your resources, as well as 10 commerce, 2 battle boosts, unit level cards, and a supply of units that are available for purchase. You'll start with 2 cities, 2 infantry, and 2 scouts that you already own and can place on the map. Speaking of the map, its size will depend on how many players there are. There are 4 rows for 3 players, 5 rows for 4 players, and 6 rows for 5 players. For four players, use the base tiles and those marked 4+. Plus. And for five players, you'll use all 24 tiles. The map should not be visible at the start, and all the tiles should point in the same direction. Next, you'll see how many map markers you need to remove. Most map markers represent resources, such as horses and wine. There should be one of each resource marker per player. So if there are four players, you'll want four horses, four wine, etc. Set aside the map markers that will only appear in later eras. For example, when starting in the ancient era, set aside iron, coffee, coal, oil, and uranium. Many markers represent huts, which give you a one-off bonus if you build a city there, or conquer it. There should be five huts per player. There are five city-states as well. Keep all five. Then determine the torn order randomly. I recommend rolling an eight-sided die. Whoever rolled highest will go first, etc. Place the play markers on the turn order sheet to remember the order. Ignore these bonuses during setup. The first player chooses a map tile, flips it over, and must choose a land space on it for her first city. The next player can place her first city on that revealed map tile or flip a new one. If she flips a new tile, she'll have to place her city on it. Once each player has placed their first city, do another round for the second city. A player's two starting cities must be separated by at least one map tile. Keep in mind that the map wraps around east-west. So for example, I couldn't place my second city in any of these tiles. Next, roll for barbarians. But first, each player can declare up to two spaces barbarian-free. Just use hit point tokens to indicate which map spaces are safe. You can assign them later in the game if you want. Roll a four-sided die for each unsafe space. If you roll a four, a barbarian city appears. Barbarian cities cannot be next to each other on the same tile, but a barbarian city could appear here. It's adjacent to an existing barbarian city, but on a different tile. Players now volunteer to serve as the banker, general, and scientist. 
The banker manages the bank's gold supply, makes sure the bank gets paid, and pays out royalties for unit purchases. The general makes sure that players buying units have access to the resources required to buy those units. And the scientist runs the technology auctions and announces what each technology unlocks when it's developed. If you're starting in the ancient era, the three volunteers get a little incentive, which I'll describe as we go. Our players are given two random leaders. The banker in the ancient era gets four. Pick one and return the others to the supply. Leaders give you unique benefits and abilities and a goal for extra glory. For example, the warrior can buy cavalry more cheaply and is aiming to have the most city conquests by the game's end. These abilities and goals are not secret, and these numbers on the card show the phases when the special abilities can be used. Your leader's goal is very important. It's highly unlikely you'll win the game if you don't accomplish it. But don't worry, if things aren't looking good, you'll be able to change your leader during the game by doing a revolution. Only when starting in the ancient era, you assign a starting technology to each player. The general always starts with bronze working, and the scientist can pick one technology of her choice from the five remaining level 1 technologies. All the other players receive one random level 1 technology. The technology's effects should be applied immediately. So for example, the general would get two battle boosts and the infantry royalty card, which should be set to level 1. Now the players receive their starting resources. In the ancient era, each player picks one strategic resource, cotton, horses, or rare metals to start with. If you're a warrior, for example, and you can buy cavalry more cheaply, you'll probably want to pick horses since you'll need them to buy cavalry. And you'll need cotton to buy ships and rare metals to build artillery. Then all the players take one more strategic resource, but randomly this time. Place the resource barrels on your civilization board to show which starting resources you have. For example, I'm starting with two horses, so I place two barrels in the horse space. Now mix all the map markers not set aside, including the city-states and the huts, into the pouch and mix them up. Players place their starting resources on their starting cities at their discretion, then randomly assign one map marker to each non-player space, including spaces with barbarian cities. Keep these markers hidden. Finally, players simultaneously place their starting units on the map. You can place up to two units per city. One starting technology, the wheel, grants two extra scouts. In that case, you won't be able to place all of your units on the map at first. You can just keep a couple units in reserve. Once all players are satisfied with their unit placements, the game can begin. Each full game round contains five stages. Movement, Warfare, Revenue, Events, and Acquisition. Each stage contains three phases. I know that sounds a little daunting, but several phases are quite short, and a couple are usually skipped. Once all the players have completed a phase in turn order, they'll proceed to the next phase. The first phase is player order. Skip it on your first turn, just keep the random order determined during setup. But in later turns, the player who has the most battle boosts can pick their turn position first. If players have the same number of boosts, the tiebreaker is the previous round's turn order. Being first is good for breaking ties, including, but rarely, when determining the winner at the end of the game. And being last is good for launching surprise attacks and picking where events take place. Each position comes with a little benefit, which is obtained immediately, but not during setup. Note that you can pick a position for rival instead of for yourself. In that case, the rival would get the benefit. Why would you want to do that? Well, barbarian units have the same levels as the first player's units. So if you're planning to fight barbarians, you may want to place a player with low unit levels in the first position. We'll come back to the Barbarian and Pirate movement phase later, and cover player movement first. Barbarians and Pirates move before players, so players can have an opportunity to react to their moves. The map is mostly hidden at first. As mentioned, the east and west sides are connected to each other, so a player could move from here to here, for example, or from here to here. Artillery and infantry units move one. Scouts and cavalry move up to two. Ships start with three movement points, and can move more as they become more advanced. That may seem like a lot, but they use movement points to embark and disembark land units. Scouts are the only units that can reveal map tokens. If you flip a map token, permanently revealing it to all players, that ends the scout's movement. When you build or conquer a city, you gain access to that space's resources or hut. To build a city, just swap out your scout for a city. You cannot do this in spaces containing rivals. Don't forget to place the appropriate resource barrel on your civilization board if there's a resource. 
For example, I get a wine resource when founding a city here. If the space contains a hut, you draw a one-off bonus card, benefiting from the brown side. Three extra population in this case. You must build or found a city to obtain this hut bonus. If you unveil a city state, then all the players immediately roll one die four and add the total number of cities they currently have. Whoever has the lowest total gets that free city and two free infantry. For this round, no hostilities are allowed in this space and the new infantry cannot move away. You can discard the city state marker, just don't put it in the pouch, and replace it with a random marker from the pouch, which is immediately revealed. Barbarian safe spaces designated by players during setup are also protected against city states. In these cases, just take another random map marker from the pouch and then place the city state marker in the pouch. Any unit can reveal a new map tile. Take a peek at the tile. If your unit can move into it, it must do so and use one movement point. If your unit can't move into it, you can reveal a tile anyway or keep it hidden. In either case, your unit has not used a movement point. When you reveal a new map tile, you'll need to do two things. Place new random map markers face down from the pouch on each land space and roll for each land space to see if any barbarian cities appear. Again, a barbarian city appears if you roll a 4 on a 4-sided die. If a barbarian city does appear, all adjacent spaces on that same tile are barbarian free. There is no need to roll for them. During the movement phase, players can place any units they have in reserve on the map, which is useful for surprise attacks. You can place up to two units per city, but only if it's not under attack or newly built. To avoid weird situations, like two enemy armies crossing each other without fighting, units can pin each other. One unit can block another unit from moving, forcing it to fight. The player being pinned chooses which of his units are pinned. Scouts can't pin enemy units, and barbarian cities, even empty ones, pin all enemy units. Ships won't appear until the end of the ancient era. As long as ships aren't available, scouts can set sail. But you'll roll a die 4 for each sea space to enter, and if you roll a 4, they are lost at sea. Darn, there goes my scout. Ships can carry up to 5 units. They use a movement point to pick units up from a space, and another movement point to drop them off onto another space. So my ship could pick up these two units here using one movement point, then one unit here for another move, then drop them all off here for a third movement point. If there's a rival ship in the space, disembarkation isn't immediate. First, you resolve the naval battle, then you can disembark and move on to land battles. The cavalry bonus movement and assign aircraft phase. Call in the cavalry. Players can move cavalry again during this phase, up to two spaces, giving them a total movement rate of four spaces per round. But remember, cavalry can be pinned by other units, and barbarian cavalry do not benefit from this bonus movement. You can also place cavalry that are in reserve into your cities during this round, up to two cavalry per city. When aircraft become available, this is also when you'll assign your aircraft to battles. They have an unlimited range, but cannot initiate battles. They can only join existing land and sea battles involving your troops or allied troops. Generate Barbarians Scouts can move into barbarian cities and explore map markers there without making the barbarians mad. But military units will cause barbarians to appear. Barbarians won't be generated if the barbarian city already contains barbarian units, unless they were placed there by an event, and the event card will tell you to place them on their sides as a reminder. Barbarians start with one unit for every three player combat units, including aircraft, on their city, plus one die four units. If you roll a four, you'll add three barbarians and roll again. If you keep rolling fours, you'll unleash a horde of barbarians. Half of the barbarian units will be infantry, round up, and half cavalry. Any units on their sides come in addition to this total. Here I'm attacking with five units, including one aircraft, which means the barbarians start with one unit, one for every three of mine. They also start with these three infantry, which were placed here by an earlier event. The infantry are lying on their sides, so I know they're from an event. Now I roll terribly, three fours and a three. That's a total of 12 barbarians from my die rolls, three from each of the three fours I rolled and had to re-roll, plus three from the three I rolled. 
So now I'm facing three Barbarian Infantry from the event, one Barbarian because of my five units, plus 12 Barbarians for my terrible die rolls. That's 16 total Barbarians. And of the 13 new ones, seven are Infantry and six Cavalry. That's a lot of Barbarians. I'll have to bribe them not to attack me, which you can do. I'll get to that later. Back to Barbarian and Pirate movement. Now that we've covered player movement and Barbarian generation, let's go back to Barbarian and Pirate movement. We saw how Barbarians appear. They're unleashed when a player attacks a Barbarian city. Sometimes events will also generate Barbarians, and Pirates only appear because of events. If there are any Barbarian or Pirate units on the map during their movement phase, because Barbarian units survived an assault against their city, for example, they always have a clear goal. They want to attack as many player cities and ships as possible, but only if they have an advantage in numbers. The exception to that are Barbarians that are on their sides because they were placed following an event. These Barbarians are protecting especially valuable cities, and so they do not move. Barbarians specifically go after the player who generated them, targeting the nearest, least defended city first. Remember, they want to attack as many cities as possible, but only if they have a numerical advantage. If they can't have a numerical advantage, they'll simply concentrate all their forces against the least defended nearest city belonging to their target. They follow the same movement rules as players, except that if they can only reach the player who generated them by sea, then they will automatically receive as many ships as they need to carry out the attack. Here, for example, the yellow player, Bob, attacked this barbarian city, unleashing a horde, and he lost the resulting battle. There are six barbarians left, and they can't reach Bob by land, so two ships appear. They need two, since one ship can only carry five units. They want to attack as many cities within range as possible, with a superior force. So two barbarians will attack this city, to this one, and to this one. You can pay a tribute to barbarians to prevent them from moving or attacking. It costs two gold per era to block all the barbarians on one specific map space. So that would be two gold in the ancient era, but ten in the future era. And the payment only prevents them from moving or attacking for one round. You'll have to cough up again if you want to continue blocking them in future rounds. In our example above, Bob might want to buy them off for one round with six gold, two per space they're in to give him time to buy reinforcements during the purchase phase. But actually, a smarter Bob would have paid them only two gold not to leave their city in the first place. Combat. A battle occurs when rival units are on the same map space, and at least one of the players present declares combat. Barbarians always declare combat. Resolve naval battles before land battles. If ships carrying land units survive the sea battle, they can immediately disembark their troops, which will be able to fight on land during this combat phase. Let's look at land combat first. Infantry are the best at city defense. Artillery are the best at attack, and are also good at defense. Cavalry are strong attackers and move fast, not to mention twice. Once during the movement stage, and once at the beginning of the warfare stage. Aircraft simply appear where they are needed, and fight just like cavalry. First, you'll compare each side's unit levels. Just add up each side's artillery, cavalry, and infantry levels. This total is called the army rank. It doesn't matter what units are actually in the battle. If barbarians are involved, they have the same army rank as the first player in turn order. Again, include the artillery level, even though barbarians never have artillery. Whoever has the highest army rank can roll extra yellow six-sided dice during each combat round. The exact number of bonus dice they get is equal to the difference between the two rival army ranks. But you can only roll a maximum of three extra dice, even if you're way more advanced than your opponent. Each side can use up to two battle boosts during the entire battle. But a player, not a barbarian, defending a city can use two additional boosts, for a total of four. You can't use boosts that you don't have, so be sure to have a supply of them, just in case. Barbarians and pirates get two battle boosts from the bank. And don't forget that some leaders allow you to use extra battle boosts. You'll still need to have them to use them. Normally, all units only have one single hit point, but all infantry defending a city get one extra hit point, represented by these orange tokens. Barbarian infantry defending a barbarian city also benefit from this homeland bonus. 
before the battle begins in earnest. Each artillery unit gets a free attack using a six-sided die. A five or six is a hit, and your rival will need to assign that hit to a unit of their choice. You can roll your yellow bonus dice too if you have a higher army rank. Now each side engages at least one unit and up to three. Both sides roll one die per engaged unit simultaneously. Infantry roll one die six, cavalry roll one die eight, artillery also roll one die eight after their initial bombardment, which used one die six, and planes roll one die eight. Though planes are represented by cards, they still fight like plastic units and are lost like a unit. In all cases, rolling a five or more is a hit. The victim chooses which of his units are hit, and only engaged units can be hit. In this example, Anna has an army rank of four, and Bob has an army rank of three. So Anna can roll one extra yellow die during each round of combat. Anna has engaged two units and rolled three hits. Bob has also engaged two units, but only rolled one hit. Anna must assign one hit to her engaged units and would lose infantry normally. Bob has to assign three to his. He would lose one infantry and reduce another to one hit point. But this would be a great time to use battle boosts. You can use a battle boost in two ways. You can convert a miss into a hit, with the attacker going first, followed by the defender, or you can block a hit with the attacker going first again. Coming back to our example, Anna can't turn any misses into hits since all three of her dice hit. Bob could turn his one miss into a hit, but he prefers to save his boosts for later. Then Anna uses a boost to block Bob's single hit, and Bob finally blocks one of her hits and accepts two others, reducing both of his infantry to one hit point. After each round of combat, both sides can engage more units, but never more than three at a time. A side can also decide to retreat, but only their unengaged units can do so. Engaged units continue fighting until the bitter end. Retreating units must retreat to the same adjacent map space, and that map space cannot contain enemy units or cities. When you conquer a city, you get one city conquest token, which is worth one glory. Whoever has the most city conquest tokens at the end of the game will earn the Genghis Khan prize. You can also seize one spare building cube from the defeated player if they have any. I'll explain these cubes soon. You get the city's resources, you draw a bonus card and get the red bonus from the bank, and if the city contains a hut, you also get the brown bonus from the bank. No population is gained or lost. If you lose a city, you lose a city conquest token if you have one. You lose the city's resources. But as compensation, you get one battle boost plus one boost per unit you lost in the battle. This is a good time to note an important rule. No player can be totally eliminated. Their last city cannot be attacked or nuked. Sea battles are very similar to land battles, except that you'll simply compare ship levels, and pirates have the same ship level as the first player in turn order. Another key difference is that ships not carrying units fight better. They roll 1 die 8 in combat instead of 1 die 6. Ships carrying units only roll 1 die 6, but they can use the units they are carrying as hit points. If they sink, all the units they are carrying also sink. Ships can't attack land units, and land units can't attack ships. Aircraft can participate in land and sea battles. If pirates defeat player ships, roll for each destroyed player ship. If you roll a 4 on a 1 die 4, that ship becomes a pirate ship. If barbarians or pirates are involved in a battle, they are jointly controlled by a volunteer player who is not involved in the battle. One final but important note, it is possible for players to join forces either against other players or against barbarians and pirates. In those cases, the ally with the most units in the battle, roll to break a die, is designated the captain, who has the final say on combat decisions. The captain's unit levels are used to compare levels with the opposing side. The captain can use their leader's abilities and benefit from the homeland infantry bonus if they're defending one of their cities. Allies don't get to engage more troops, the maximum is still three per round, and they don't get to use more battle boosts. Gold revenue. This is pretty straightforward. The more people you have, the more taxes you generate one gold per population to be exact. But 
you also need infrastructure to support your population. Here I have 15 population, which would normally get me 15 gold. But I only have two buildings, so the maximum I can get is 12 gold. New buildings appear as players research technologies. Trade. The more different resources you have, the more commerce you generate. Chances are you'll be missing some resources in your empire, and the other players will have some duplicates. In that case, you can trade. One resource for one resource, for example. Or resources for payments. Players can come up with all kinds of trades. You can trade royalty rights, great artworks, gold, commerce. Such trades don't have to take place during this phase, but resource trades do. Trades are not enforced, except resource trades. They must last at least one full round. Some resources are required to build certain units. For example, you'll need horses if you want to build cavalry in the ancient and medieval eras. You can trade with barbarians if you have a scout on their city. Place your scout on the resource you're getting and place a gray barrel on your sieve board on the space matching that resource. You'll also have to give one of your resources to the barbarians by placing it on the turn order sheet. I just traded gems for horses, for example. The trade remains in place as long as your scout stays there. And if several players want the same barbarian resource, there'll be an auction. Commerce generation. This is when your resources and trading fleet generate commerce. For the resources, you should only count the different types of resources you have. Ignore duplicates. For example, I have two horses, one silk, and three gold. That's three different resources, so I get 12 commerce. For your trading fleet, count how many ships you have in reserve. Don't include those on the map. The number of ships that can generate commerce depends on their level. In this case, my ships are at level 1, so only two of them can generate commerce. To be clear, I can have as many ships as I want in reserve, but only two of them will generate commerce. If you realize your trading fleet isn't at full capacity, you can pay to take ships from the map back into your reserves. It costs one gold or one battle boost per ship. You're only earning the commerce from the rightmost filled space. So with my two ships, I get four commerce, not six. If there are any pirates on the map, all players will make 50% less commerce from both resources and ships during this phase. Wonders. The Wonders phase is when you see if you've qualified for a World Wonder by meeting the conditions at the bottom of its card. They're also listed on your purchase sheet. For example, to get the pyramids, you need at least two artillery, two cavalry, two infantry, and three raised buildings, which are buildings of your color on your sieve board. If you already have a Wonder, this phase is often when you benefit from it. For example, whoever has the pyramids gets two commerce every Wonder phase. If several players qualify for a wonder in the same round, all those who qualified get a glory bonus in the form of one glory token. But there can only be one builder. The card and your purchase sheet will tell you what the tiebreaker is. It's often a turn order, so keep that in mind. In addition to getting glory for qualifying, the wonder's builder will also get extra glory, but only at the end of the game and not in the form of a glory token. That's because you might lose the wonder during the game. Indeed, the owner will place the new wonder on one of their cities on the map. If that city is taken over, then whoever has conquered it will seize the wonder and benefit from its abilities, and from its current owner glory bonus at the end of the game. Event Cards The last player in turn order picks a barbarian city containing no barbarian units. Reveal its map token, if it's still hidden. If a city state is revealed, players roll for it and no event is drawn. Otherwise, the last player draws an event card and resolves it. If the event applies to a barbarian city, it will apply to the one that was just picked, unless specified otherwise. Events labeled bad are bad. They can be blocked from taking place by any player who has earned goodwill from another card. For example, from this refugees card. If the event involves an auction, follow the technology auction rules that I will get to soon. If the event triggers a battle, resolve it immediately. Don't wait for the next combat phase. Players with nukes can use them in any order after the event has been completely resolved. Pick a space, any space. Nuking it removes all man-made items on it. Cities, units, wonders, barbarian items. You can nuke barbarian cities or pirate ships. If you nuke a wonder, you'll lose two glory. If one of your cities is nuked, you'll be able to do a violent revolution for free during the next phase. Regime and revolution. As we've seen during setup, players all start with a leader. Several leaders give you a bonus during the Regime and Revolution phase. Make sure to get those now. If you're not happy with your leader, you can do a Revolution. You'll need to pay half of the commerce you just generated during the Commerce Generation phase. If you do a Peaceful Revolution, you'll have to pick a new leader between two random ones. 
But if you want to choose your new leader or keep your current one, then you can do a violent revolution. In that case, you'll lose half the gold you just earned during the gold revenue phase, in addition to losing half the commerce you made. Why would you want to do a violent revolution to keep your current leader? Well, revolutions also allow you to, optionally, give up all your city conquest tokens to qualify for the Gandhi Priest Prize, which is worth three glory at the end of the game. During this phase, players can also choose their government or regime type. You will need to pay to switch from one regime to another. There are discounts when converting from a republic to a democracy and from a monarchy to communism. The effects of your new regime will apply immediately. For example, you could become a democracy by paying 20 gold. That's a one-off cost. You would immediately receive 10 commerce, and you'd receive 10 commerce again during every future regime and revolution phase. Bid for technology. Every turn, a selection of technologies will be up for auction. One technology per player, minus one. So someone is going to be shortchanged. The technologies available will be the ones with the lowest numbers at the top left, including any that weren't sold during previous rounds. So four players are starting in the ancient era. They've each been assigned one level one tech, leaving the alphabet and masonry technologies. Those two are available for purchase, plus currency, the first level two technology, since three technologies are available for four players. The players will first bid for the technology with the lowest number at the top left, the alphabet in this case. Players make secret bids using their dry erase cards and markers. All bids must be in commerce, but you can convert gold into commerce, one for one. Whoever has bid the maximum, and at least the minimum bid indicated at the bottom of the card, gets the technology. You can bid nothing, of course, but then you won't win. If there is a tie, the tied player who is first in turn order wins. A player can only buy one technology per round. If no one bids for technology, players can proceed to the next technology unless it has a higher level. You can't buy a higher level technology unless all the lower level ones have been bought. So currency, a level 2 technology, will only be available for auction when the alphabet and masonry technologies have been bought. Technology is a very cost-effective way to earn glory. Don't take a glory token. You can use the card itself to count your glory at the game's end. When you buy them, technologies give you one-off pennies, like free units, free battle boosts, or free population. These are all listed in the white section of the card. When you get an icon card, pick either a left icon, the visionary, or the right one, the voice. You'll roll for visionaries and get whatever you roll. With Imhotep, I'd roll a six-sided die and add one to see how much commerce I get. On average, the voice will get you less, but you know what you're getting, and it includes gold. Sometimes two icons are illustrated on a side, that's just for flavor. You'll still only get the benefit once. Some technologies, with this building icon, unlock new buildings. Whoever buys the technology gets one building cube of each player color. She can place the cube of her color on her civilization board, thereby increasing the amount of gold she can collect every round. As for the other cubes, she can sell or trade them to the other players, or keep them for herself. Some technologies, like this one, unlock higher unit levels. The player who buys the technology can upgrade all of her units of that type one level for free. You don't need access to a specific resource to upgrade your units. Usually, the player who unlocks new unit levels also gets royalties for that type of unit. Whenever another player buys a unit of that type, the royalty holder will get one gold from the bank. Take the royalty card as a reminder. It also shows the maximum level that unit can be and what resource is required to build it. The technology card will show you where to put the sliders. Technologies can impact what key resources are needed to build units. Developing gunpowder, for example, means artillery units can now go up to level 2, and you'll need iron to build them. Some technologies unlock wonders, which all players can try to build during the next wonder phase, as we saw earlier. Finally, some technologies will reveal new resources on the map. When that happens, as many resources as there are players appear in the game. Split them into two evenly divided piles. So iron working reveals iron on the map. If we had three players, we'd add three iron tokens and create one pile with one token and one pile with two tokens. The smallest pile will be distributed to player cities. Each player rolls one die four and adds all the barrels of their color, those on their civilization board, but also those they've traded to rivals or barbarians. For example, Anna here has seven barrels of her color in all. The player with the lowest total gets one of the new resources, but the player with the second lowest total picks which city appears in. Repeat this process until the smallest pile of resources is empty. The resources in the next pile go to barbarian cities. 
Use the same process, rolling one die four and adding resource barrels, except this time the player with the lowest total will pick the barbarian city where one of the new resources appears. Note that a map space can end up containing several resources in this manner. After a while, you will trigger the beginning of a new era. Follow the steps on the card, and keep in mind that any technologies from the new era will only become available during the next bid for technology phase. So let's say maps and optics are the only ancient era technology left. Well, it will be the only card players can bid on during this phase. The medieval technologies will become available during the next bid for technology phase. For time constrained players, the end of an era is a good time to end the game. But first you'll need to complete the two other phases of the acquisition stage. Create great artworks. Artworks are the cheapest way to earn glory, but you can only create one artwork per round. You should stick to a suit to maximize glory you earn, which is listed at the back of the card. So for example, if you have three triangle cards and one circle card, you'll earn six glory for the triangles and one for the circle, for a total of seven glory at the end of the game. If you're desperate for gold, you can sell an artwork to the bank at any time for the price listed on the back of the card. Purchases. I recommend that the players do a separate round for each type of purchase to make it feel faster. Start by seeing if any players want to purchase a starship. Starships are only available at the end of the game when fusion has been developed, but they appear on top of the purchase sheet because if they're available, that's the first thing players will want to buy because if at least one player buys a starship, that triggers the end of the game, but only after all the players have completed their purchases. So that means multiple players could buy starships. Then see if any players want to purchase glory tokens, which are also very expensive at 50 commerce. This note reminds you that gold can be converted to commerce. Then proceed to scouts. They cost three gold. Building cubes can't be purchased from the bank. They only appear with technologies. But now's a good time to see if players want to trade cubes or straight up sell them for gold, commerce, or favors. You can increase your population by one for two gold or by discarding a scout you own. You can buy a battle boost for one gold. As we've seen, they're used in combat to mitigate bad luck, but also to determine the player turn order. If a higher unit level has been unlocked, you can upgrade all of your units of that type by one level for one gold or one battle boost per unit. You'll have to upgrade all of them at the same time, both those on the map and those in reserve. There's a minimum upgrade cost of three gold and or boosts, so even if you have no units of that type, you'll still need to cough up three gold and or boosts. You don't need access to a resource to upgrade units. It's free to put units in your reserves on the map, but if you want to put units on the map back into your reserves, you'll need to pay one gold or one boost per unit. This can be a quick way to redistribute your troops over vast distances. Remember, units in reserve are units you've bought or obtained from technology or events. Do not confuse them with the units in your supply, which you do not own. When buying units, there are two main things to remember. Do you have access to the required resource? and do royalties need to be paid. The required resource isn't specified on the purchase sheet since they will vary during the game. You don't actually consume the resource, you just need access to it. It has to be on your civilization board, and it doesn't have to belong to you. Here, for example, Anna, who's blue, obtained horses from Bob, who's red, so she can build cavalry. Players can all agree to play a variant in which you can buy units even if you don't have the required resource for them, but it will cost twice as much. This note means that you can use battle boosts instead of gold for the purchase. Whoever holds the royalty card gets the royalties, which are paid by the bank. The royalty card also indicates what the current required resource is. A royalty owner buying those units must pay the full purchase price to the bank. He or she does not get a royalty payment in these cases. All new units are first placed into your reserves, not on the map. Aircraft and nukes only appear when flight and fission are discovered, respectively. They are represented by cards and stay in your reserves. Once you've made all of your purchases, you can place up to two units from your reserves on each of your cities. Ships count towards that limit. You can keep units in reserve to be placed during later turns, including for surprise attacks. End game. The game ends whenever the players want it to end. I recommend playing at least one full era, which should be about three hours. The game will always end once at least one starship is bought, but only once all the players have completed all of their purchases. Once you're done, players simply add up the glory and the winner is declared. Use the back of the purchase sheet to help you, as well as the back of the technology and wonder cards. 
Don't forget leader goals and the five different prizes. In case of a tie, all tied players share the victory. But I know that's repugnant to many gamers. So if at least one player insists on crowning a single victor, then the tied player with the most commerce and gold, add the two, wins. If it's still a tie, then the tied player who is first in turn order wins. Good luck and happy gaming.